again the second lecture by Jayan on uh, mechanisms of amyloid fibril formation by proteins. So a large part of my previous talk was related to phi value analysis and it is actually a type of experiment which uh, my lab does not do. Um, we have been trying to as you may have figured out from my first talk uh, try to use more direct methods for structure formation. Um, so and when we use direct methods for structure formation in protein folding one has to use many different probes because uh, the process is heterogeneous and so you need to get a lot of uh, different types of information on the process and hopefully using site specific probes. And we, when we started working on protein aggregation five, six years, ago, six, seven years ago, we decided to follow the same uh, approach for studying this other type of protein self-assembly. This time into aggregates which uh, have specific structure, uh, which are regular aggregates, and uh, we are interested in how these regular aggregates form from either unfolded protein or native protein. So uh, what I'll do is start off with some slides which I'm sure Dave, well, he showed some of them or variants of the same in his first talk. But this is just to get me warmed up uh, on this different topic. So the question really is how do you get very regular aggregates of proteins uh, starting from your native protein or your unfolded protein? What are the early oligomers that form and how do you try and characterize these oligomers. So what I'll be doing in the bulk of my talk really is talk more generally about aggregation. And again, this is going to be more from a chemist perspective and not from a physicist perspective. And the idea is to let you realize or know how most experimentalists in the field probably are thinking about the aggregation problem uh, so that it becomes easier for physicists perhaps to understand the language which, which uh, experimentalists use. So we have been studying as I said uh, regu uh, you know aggregation is pertaining to amyloid fibril formation for five, six years ago. But we became interested in it uh, nearly ten years ago when in uh, some collaborative work with Raghavan Vardarajan we saw that during folding you could see an aggregate forming in your reaction mixture and then during the folding process it spontaneously disappeared. So you can see a white milky aggregate being formed and then quantitatively you would see scattering going up and then coming down as folding proceeded to the native structure. So this was some work which we did with the maltose binding protein. So aggregates are species which form all the time in folding reactions, in unfolding reactions. So we have been studying the unfolding of uh, a protein called thyroidoxin. And we could show that an unfolding intermediate is formed at, uh, under some conditions. And this unfolding intermediate goes into aggregates. And in this case, the, the aggregates seem to be uh, amyloid fibril-like, but we could never really conclusively show that uh, the amyloid fibrils are coming directly from this initial aggregate. It's something which we still would want to do. But you can, using methods of studying protein folding, identify such intermediates and then try and identify the early aggregates which form from this and then subsequently how these go on to form fibrils. So what we had wanted to do in this case, for example, is to show that the rate of fibril formation is directly uh, proportional to the concentration of the aggregate because that would tell you that this aggregate is directly going into fibril formation. We could show that the amount of aggregate is proportional to the amount of this intermediate, but we couldn't show that the rate is proportional and so we kind of gave up uh, proceeding further on, on this uh, after the initial study. But it, from folding studies, you could identify an equilibrium intermediate and show that that aggregated. So, uh, so this is, uh, so much of, or at least some of what I'll be talking is in, in a 
review which Santosh and I wrote and which got published in Current Science a few months ago. And so the idea is how do you go from either a native or an unfolded protein to a structured intermediate which forms a soluble oligomer which might in it contain the nucleus and then this goes on to form other types of regular structures such as fibrils or protofibrils or spherical oligomers. So these are the type of questions part of my lab has been interested in in the past uh, several years and we have been working in our aggregation work with several different proteins uh, including uh, the alpha synuclein, the prion protein and the tau protein. Guy three from my lab has had a poster up on a work with the tau protein and I hope some of you have uh, had a chance to look at it. It will give you a flavor of the type of work we do. So, so the uh, remarkable aspect about protein, fold, uh, protein aggregation into fibrils is that proteins with very different native structures seem to be forming fibrils of very similar cross structure. So they all have a certain type of uh, cross beta structure. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. But many different proteins do this. And many of the proteins which do this are in some way or the other associated with some human disease or animal disease. Uh, so you have, for example, the prion proteins, you have uh, the A beta protein uh, uh, associated with Alzheimer's, and you have many other proteins uh, uh, associated with a very large number of uh, diseases. Uh, there are also proteins which form such fibrils, but the fibril formation is, is, in, is, uh, is associated with some physiological function of the organism. So, for example, the protein curlin uh, in E. coli forms amyloid fibrils, and this, these amyloid fibrils help the, uh, help the bacteria to stick to a new surface. And there are a whole range of other proteins and different types of organisms which have been identified to form amyloid fibrils where the fibrils have some physiological function. And one very nice example is a protein mentioned by Dave in his first talk, uh, sub-35, the yeast prion protein, where the protein has a particular function in the cell. What is done is that the aggregate is a way to sequester away the protein. And because it is sequestered away, the function can no longer take place. And for the function to take place, the aggregate has to dissociate back into active protein. So this is something which seems to be a way of controlling physiology within cells. You form a reversible aggregate which takes away an active component. And if you want the active component back, you need the aggregate to dissociate back to the active protein. So this is perhaps a common theme in more than one instance than the instance I described here. So I mentioned that the structures of amyloid fibrils are very similar at the gross level. They all have this cross beta motif. Uh, you have a beta strand perpendicular and a beta sheet parallel to the axis. And you have structures which have been identified by uh, both X-ray of microcrystals, X-ray crystallographic studies of microcrystals formed by peptides that form these objects as well as solid state NMR and hydrogen exchange methods, which show for a variety of proteins that you have this structure. So you could have two of these going down the axis. So the axis here is going in this way. Uh, there have been models put forth for, for other structures for, uh, for uh, amyloid fibrillar structure. And this is what's a beta barrel, beta helix structure for polyglutamine fibrils. This is a helix which uh, uh, would contain, be able to contain uh, ions or water within it. So you have these structures which are very similar for many different proteins, uh, but at the, at the, if you look at the structure in detail, you will find that there are uh, uh, differences which uh, depend, for example, on how you form the fibril. So for example, for A-beta, the protein associated with uh, Alzheimer's, you can form the fibrils under different conditions. So if you form them under conditions where you don't shake your solution, you will find that the fibrils look different in EM, 
from those when you form them when you shake the solution. And if you do solid state NMR of the uh, fibrils, you find, you know, small but very distinct differences between the fibrils formed in the two cases. Uh, so, for example, you can see that the positions and the distribution of peaks in these colored circles is different for the fibrils formed under the two different conditions. And even if you look at the morphologies of fibrils formed under different conditions, you will find that you can have fibrils of different uh, thickness, of different uh, interhelical uh, spacing with, within when you have different filaments intertwined around each other, etc. So depending on the condition in which you form them, you get fibrils of different structure. And even under the same condition, it's possible to get fibrils of different structure. What kind of? So you have a solid fibril sample, uh, which needs to be specifically labeled. So most of the solid state NMR work is done with little peptides which form uh, these amyloid fibrils because with uh, larger proteins it becomes difficult to very specifically label specific residues. So you need to be able to put C. Uh, carbon labeling at uh, specific points, otherwise you can't get specific structural information. Hmm? Powder samples, yeah. I've never done the measurement, so I don't know anything beyond that. <laughs> so, uh, so similarly for prion proteins, if you create them by shaking, you have these curly objects, S-shaped objects. If you rotate the sample, you have these uh, more regular long type objects. And one of the things which I find very puzzling is what is the role played by this type of mechanical, uh, what are the mechanical, how do these mechanical forces act? Uh, I mean, you only, if I read papers, one just finds very broad uh, descriptions of some shear force or whatever when I just which I don't understand but uh, you know this is something which uh, can speed up aggregation quite dramatically so for example for the tau for uh, synuclein if you don't shake you will not get fibrils for months sometimes but if you shake you can get them within hours so uh, the role played by this mechanical perturbation is not fully understood. But you can have different morphologies for different prion proteins and the different morphologies are on, uh, defined whether one type of protein can cross seed another type of protein, one species to another. Yeah? So, so broadly speaking, you get more linear fibrils when you shake, is, is, that, is that the general? I don't think there's a, so this is, sh Which what is do you mean more linear? These are all linear, in the, but this is got curvature. I don't know what causes the curvature. Right, no, but so, the left, left picture also, the left top looks also not, well, branched or, or at least it has a lot of different, uh, I don't it has a lot of polydispersity. It, I don't think it's branched. I, I, no, no, it looks, I, yeah, I, I, I understand. But, uh, but basically, so, so the comparison I'm looking at is left to right or left to, yeah. So these are uh, just, uh, I think this is an EM picture, this is an AFM picture of the okay. same. Yeah. No, I mean, one thing that shaking can do is just to take smaller fragments and, and push, you know, just in, create a cross-section between the, hmm. the different fragments so that they just sort of aggregate together. Is, is that... I don't think that happens it, because it, in terms of diameters, I, if I remember right, you don't see differences. Okay. But I. I or or just break up the small guys, and that that's. They would the, the long guys would would break. Uh, uh, okay. Oh. But and so then you would have more, more uh, seeds yeah. from which further aggregation could happen. Uh, but I don't think it's limited only to to that okay because it's having some action right at the early steps where you don't have the long guys formed okay okay 
Pardon? Forces or is this diversity uh, endogenously present? Do you know? So, so the uh, uh, so if you so in the cell, if you try to look for at least for the prion protein, I don't know whether you get within the cell you will get fibrils of different morphology. If that's the question you're asking. But you find that if you look across different species where the differences in sequence are very minor, a few residues, you find that the structures of the fibrils are very different. And these structures of the fibrils being different is what is responsible for whether human prion can, can seed mouse uh, prion to aggregate or not. So, as I said early in the talk, that we are interested in the early steps during aggregation. So, what are the early soluble aggregates which form, and how do they then go on to form more longer aggregates, such as longer protofibrils and eventually fibrils? Uh, so, what are these spherical oligomers, and how do they associate? And uh, what has happened in the past few years is that from several different proteins, it appears that these guys, the insoluble fibrils, are not the toxic species, but instead it is the early soluble aggregates, the protofibrillar aggregates, which seem to be toxic uh, to cells. And this has been shown for several different proteins. So uh, this is a very nice study which came out two, three years ago uh, on the Alzheimer's a beta protein, where you, they showed that spherical oligomers were formed, which seemed to eventually lead to fibril formation. And these spherical oligomers were what were toxic to the cells, uh, so not the fibril. So, for example, you find that the intermediates, these guys, are what are more toxic, whereas the fibril toxicity is much, much less. So, when you see time frames such as this, where you start with uh, you don't see any aggregates and you see larger aggregates more regular you tend to believe that one form is leading to another form and part of the difficulty in understanding aggregation is really figuring out whether this form is actually leading directly to the short aggregates and whether the short guys are directly leading to the long guys because these for example could be off pathway to the long guys and it's not at all easy to figure out whether this is what the sequence of events is in the formation of the long fibrillar structures. The differences in toxicity by a factor of two or even three or four, hmm. I mean, I would say that's not a qualitative difference. Whereas in hmm. terms of what may be the mechanisms for the oligomers, to be hmm. toxic versus the, the fibrils. Hmm. Uh, the thinking is that it's a qualitatively different mechanism, right? So the idea is that, yeah, so the idea is that the soluble guys form pores in membranes. And so these are AFM pictures of a variety of amyloid forming proteins, fib, you know, f soluble aggregates sitting on membranes. And they all seem to be forming pore like structures on the membrane. So the idea is that you have, you're permeabilizing the membrane when you have these soluble aggregates uh, present at the membrane uh, uh, surface. Now, but based on something like this, I would imagine that the toxicity of the, the larger scale aggregates will be negligible on the same scale. In, in that previous uh, picture. Yes, so the idea is that perhaps the larger guys are not really toxic at all. And it's just, you know, if you have a toxic soluble compound, the best way to deal with it is to precipitate it out. And perhaps the cell has figured out how to do it, you know, to get rid of the toxic material by making it insoluble. But there is, there are, and there have been 
lot of reports which directly implicate these guys sitting on membranes and somehow having a toxic uh, function. But, uh, I do not know too much of that literature. So, we got interested in aggregation when one of the proteins which has been our workhorse for folding studies, uh, we found very early on forms soluble aggregates. And about eight, nine years ago, we did uh, some three-dimensional NMR studies of this very large aggregate. It's a molecular weight of 160,000. And we could essentially, well, say that uh, the structure is somewhat like a reverse micelle where the, the C-terminal part forms the core of the aggregate, whereas the 25 residues at the N-terminal end are free to move around in solution. So we could do this by doing, as I said, three-dimensional NMR and assigning different parts of the sequence to the spectra of the protein. So this aggregate, which is soluble and will uh, formed at low pH, if you allow it to sit for three weeks or four weeks, will go into uh, protofibrillar structures. And when we did this study with the NMR, we didn't know that it formed aggregates because you don't really keep uh, the protein sitting around for uh, too long. The, the 3D NMR experiments actually take 10 days to do. And very often at the, at the end of the experiment, Juhi saw a white precipitate at the bottom of the NMR tube, but we never went on to see what it was. It's only later that we found that uh, it goes into amyloid protofibrils. And uh, if you just, the activation energy for this process is quite high. So if you do the experiment at 50 degrees or 60 degrees, it will form in a couple of hours instead of two, three weeks. And then it becomes amenable, the process becomes amenable to study. And a few years ago, we could show that this 160,000 molecular weight uh, A form, which is actually an aggregate of 16 different monomers, associates to form higher oligomeric intermediates which then go on to form larger aggregates, which form protofibrils. Uh, under the conditions we studied then, the protofibrils didn't really seem to go into what are recognized as regular fibrils, which are 10 nanometers in thickness. These seem to have thicknesses of the order of 2 to 3 nanometers. Uh, if you waited very long, these just became longer and longer. They didn't become fatter and fatter. So, we could dissect out several steps during this. We could show that there were multiple events happening. We did a, what Santosh went on to do uh, was, uh, which I'll describe a little later, is to do a scanning mutagenesis study to find out what residues in the sequence are important in the aggregation process, and I'll come to that a little later. What I'll first do is to really describe how one really thinks about aggregation. Now, protein aggregation has been studied for 40, 50 years because there are very important molecules in your cell which function as aggregates. So, actin, myosin, for example, which are very important for maintaining the shape of your cells, uh, are large aggregates. Uh, these, they're, filament, uh, they're large filaments. And so, much of the ideas of how biochemists look at aggregation come from the work done on proteins such as actin and myosin, come from work done on proteins such as hemoglobin, you know, sickle cell hemoglobin aggregates. And uh, there's a lot of beautiful work done by Bill Eaton, one of the pioneers of fast methods in protein folding studies on sickle cell hemoglobin many years ago before he entered into the protein folding field. So, the ideas which came about was that the, you know, the process was somewhat likened to crystallization, that you had a nucleus being formed, and once you had a nucleus being formed, a kinetic nucleus in the sense this was the slow step, once this formed, you had the process zipping along to form your polymeric structure. And there were several different features of a nucleation-dependent polymerization process which were recognized. One is that you had your free energy increasing to the size of the nucleus and then decreasing. So your rate of formation, uh, here the rate of dissociation exceeds the rate of formation. 
And after this, the rate of association exceeds the rate of dissociation. So things become much more favorable with every step. Uh, so for such a process, you would expect a process which is slow in the beginning and then speeds up. So you see what's called a lag phase. And I'll describe to you a little later about what type of kinetics you would expect for this. You also expect what's called a critical concentration, where the, if you plot the rate of elongation, you find that below a particular concentration, the rate is zero, so nothing is formed. And the process should be seeded. So if you add this to, the big, to a solution without any aggregate, the whole process gets seeded up. And I'll describe why the kinetics should be exponential in such a case. So this is something which is, uh, um, has been described for a variety of systems for amyloid fibril formation. But it's very difficult, uh, and I'll describe why it, it is to establish that many aggregation reactions go through a nucle nucleation-dependent polymerization process. The other type of aggregation which has been uh, studied uh, uh, and pertains, for example, to actin polymerization is what's called linear, po linear polymerization and uh, or isodesmic polymerization. Where you, the difference between these two is really that the rate constants don't really change uh, as the process, as your polymer grows. Here, rate constants are different before the nucleus formation and after the nucleus formation. So both linear and the nucleation-dependent polymerization, the kinetics of such processes were described in detail by Usawa, uh, I think, in the 60s. And uh, I'll talk a little about uh, uh, that a little later. So Usawa is, uh, was a, one of the pioneering Japanese biophysicists, and I think a lot of, uh, many of the uh, well-known single molecule biologists in Japan uh, descend from his lab, either students or postdocs or grand students. So when we talk about nucleation, I already talked about this when I, in the first, uh, in the earlier talk. Uh, you have a, a free energy term, which is a surface term, which goes in R square, and you have an energy term, which depends on the volume, which goes as an R cube. And so that's a bulk term and the surface term, so you have a free energy barrier to the uh, aggregation process. So this is uh, phase A going into a phase B. And so you have this critical uh, free energy, which is given by this expression as shown out here. So the droplet formation when you have these phases going for a phase transition is an activated process, and the rate of forming a droplet is proportional to this uh, exponent minus delta G critical by KT. So what I'll do now is just very quickly run through a description of aggregation, which has really been taken from this book. And this book is really not on, on aggregation per se, but is on what the topic implies on motor proteins. But it has a chapter on polymerization, which I think is something which anyone works on aggregation should, should read. So the first case really is the case of this linear polymerization as shown out here. So you have A1 plus An giving you An plus 1, and you have an equilibrium constant, which is the same for each step of the process. So this is also what's called an Einstein polymer. So you're assuming the Ks are the same, but in reality they should change. So now uh, you would uh, expect... Uh, uh, so you can think about this process about what is more preferable, whether a monomer going to monomer or a monomer joining to a po long polymer in terms of entropic considerations. So when a monomer binds to a long polymer, it loses more entropy because uh, uh, more translational and rotational entropy than when it binds to another monomer because a dimer can rotate and move uh, more freely than a long polymer. So the association between two monomers will be stronger than between a monomer and polymer. So the case should change. But uh, you can then assume that uh, for most practical purposes, the case is roughly within the same order of magnitude. Okay. 
but the idea then is that this entropic effect is influences nucleation but not growth of the fibril of the of the uh, polymer so you could have so when you have this type of single stranded filament uh, it's easy to show that if you have a single stranded filament the that the length of a single stranded filament cannot be too large so the expression which you will get if you just write down the equilibrium constants and uh, express uh, the length in terms of uh, the total protein or subunit uh, concentration is that uh, you have a square root of the concentration divided with the equilibrium constant. So these objects cannot really be very long at all. So this is uh, something which is uh, not, uh, so is, this is not what you observe. You find that even for actin or myosin filaments or for the fibril formation, you find long, long filaments. So either you are not at equilibrium in such situations, uh, because remember this is a description for an equilibrium condition or something else must be true. And uh, what is true is that in usually filaments are not single stranded but are multi stranded. And the moment you have multi strands because now you have two types of interactions, you can have filaments which are much, much longer which can really grow to a very long size. Okay? What is also important to realize both for the single stranded case and for the multi stranded case is that the length distributions are expected to be exponential. Okay, so you have fewer and fewer longer and longer fibrils. Uh, what is, so this is something which you expect but very often what we have seen for example with in our studies of fibrils of different proteins that you don't see this exponential distribution. We still see a in many cases, we see a Gaussian distribution. It's something which we don't understand, but it's obvious that we're not perhaps in an equilibrium situation uh, in these cases. So uh, one has to realize that when one does experimental studies, one has usually a probe for the reaction. And when the probe stops changing its signal, you assume that the process is over. Now, uh, the process, uh, so whether the process is over to an experimentalist depends on the probe the experimentalist uses. And very often when, you know, your fluorescence signal might not change anymore, the process, uh, the, your filament could be just silently growing without having any obvious spectroscopic signal. Or it might be breaking apart at uh, when it reaches equilibrium, okay. So it's also possible, and again, this is described in some detail in, in this book, and the mathematics of all this is described very nicely in the appendix, appendices in the book. Uh, it's uh, easy to show that for multi-stranded filaments, the, both uh, the annealing, which is the growth, occurs by monomer addition and not by large oligomers adding. And uh, when it, the size decreases, it also ha happens by monomer coming off. And experimentally, this has been shown. For example, Chris Dobson has been able to show that uh, this type of molecular cycling where monomers come out for one of the proteins uh, he works on. So, um, uh, so when uh, for multi-stranded filaments, uh, it's difficult to break off uh, a large, you know, break something in the middle because if you break in the middle, you have to break three bonds which, uh, between subunits. In, for a single stranded filament, you could easily break in the middle also because there's only one bond connecting the two. So if you look at, you know, enthalpic and entropic considerations, you can really... Uh, rationalize much of what you expect for multi-stranded and single-stranded filaments. So for such filaments, you expect a critical concentration, I'll come to this again a little later, where what you see is that below this concentration, at this concentration, elongation rate becomes zero. And 
if you look at the total amount of protein either as monomer or as polymer, uh, you find that even when the polymer has grown as much as it can, there will always be some monomer left in solution and that will be at very high polymer concentration equal to the critical concentration. So you, all your protein will never go into polymer. Okay. And uh, in such models, multistranded filaments should grow to a very large length. And this is something which one sees, but it's not like in, uh, in many physical systems where you find only one large aggregate being formed. Okay. If you look at your experimental solution, you will, you will find very often a few long objects, but you will, there will always be a population of them. You will ne there will never be just one large uh, aggregate. So, and this is probably a property of linear aggregation. You know, if you have two-dimensional aggregation or clumps being formed, you will invariably expect things to form one big mass because of the surface energy considerations. So, Jayant, all this analysis is uh, um, assuming that the different growing filaments do not interact with each other, right? Do not reach? Interact with each other. Yeah. Is, is that a good assumption in the conditions uh, in which uh, fibril formation is studied experimentally? Uh, I would think it's... it's uh, See, the thing is, there are indications that, uh, and we showed that, uh, I, I just showed you a summary slide of that study, but in that study, we could somewhat indirectly show that one of the last steps in the aggregation is lateral association of filaments. So th things do come together. And what we proposed there was that two filaments come together. It's not that a multi-stranded guy is growing by monomers adding. So two things are coming together, bilateral association. And other people have also talked about this. It's, for example, been reported for A-beta that uh, filaments come together uh, bilaterally associating with each other late in the aggregation process. Uh, so there would be interaction between filaments, but uh, how it affects the actual growth, I don't know. Um, So the other way to think about a critical concentration or the chemist's way of looking at uh, a critical concentration is just to treat the process as an equilibrium process where many objects associate to form a big object. And if you have an equilibrium such as this Na giving you An, and N is large, you will see, if you look at the number of molecules per object, you will see a curve like this. And the larger the value of n, the sharper this is. So when you see something like this and n is very large, this, what this means is that at con any concentration below this, you will see only monomer. And any concentration above this, you will see only polymer. So this is a case where it's a treatment given for my cells, but the same thing uh, would uh, apply to any uh, any type of aggregate. So if you come now to uh, nucleation, um, so you're talking now about uh, a set of necessary but unfavorable steps in the reaction that bottleneck the formation of large aggregates. And these steps are supposed to constitute the formation of a critical nucleus. So now we are really talking about a kinetic nucleus. So the, from the thermodynamic viewpoint, the nucleus represents a turning point in the balance between tra loss translational and rotational entropy and intermolecular bond energy. And uh, an aggregate is post-nuclear if for a given concentration of monomers, the addition of the monomer adds to stability rather than decreases its uh, increasing its instability. If you remember the bell-shaped delta G curve, you are now after the top of the curve. And from the kinetic viewpoint, the rate of monomer addition to the aggregate exceeds the rate of monomer loss. So that's again something I mentioned before you had dissociation being faster than association after 
association becomes faster. Okay. The other point is that the nucleus may be the result of a single steric step such as closure of a ring or a tube or the completion of the first turn of a helix, uh, but you do not necessarily need to have a special structure being formed. And this is a quite a good treatment of aggregation from the chemist's perspective. So, if you have a process such as this, so this is a review by Ferron and Methods and Enzymology in 1999. You see this type of curve and the, you just by a little mathematical, it is a rather crude way of showing it. You can show that the rate constants, ratio of rate constants goes as this, uh, it depends exponentially on the slope of this curve. Uh, and so, when the slope changes, you will find one rate constant becoming faster than the other. So, the early models of simple models of aggregation are all, as I said, derived from Usawa and so are called by many people the Usawa model. So, you are talking about equilibrium constants changing bef before the nucleation step and post nucleation. And after the nucleation step, the inverse of the dissociation constant gives you the critical concentration. So, uh, since most people are st still at the back, I, I would not really go through this, but uh, you can in a simplistic way describe the kinetics of the, uh, of both homogeneous uh, nucleation and heterogeneous nucleation. Uh, since I will be leaving the, the transparencies, it is anyone who reads this would be able to follow it. It is a lot of it is taken from different papers by reviews by Ferron. Uh, and uh, you can describe the kinetics using Ferron's uh, description both for homogeneous nucleation and for secondary nucleation. So, secondary nucleation includes both fragmentation where long polymers break up uh, or heterogeneous nucleation which is at some external surface of a lateral growth which is also a kind of heterogeneous nucleation. So, uh, uh, you have equations which describe these processes and it is there are only a few cases where it has been a possible to test these equations for amyloid fibril formation. And one of the better studies was a study done by Wetzel and Ferron on the Huntington polyglutamine, on a Huntington polyglutamine fragment. And they could show, describe the kinetics using uh, the equations uh, which are derived uh, out here and show, get the size of the nucleus. And what, for example, they saw for the nucleus for this polyglutamine fragment. Uh, there are a whole range of aggregation diseases caused by proteins containing long stretches of polyglutamines uh, was that the size of the nucleus was a monomer. And so, essentially the nucleation step was a conformational change in the monomeric protein. And it is difficult to uh, get analytical solutions to those, uh, to these equations. And what uh, Ferron ended up doing was using a perturbation method which was used in the study of Wetzel and Ferron to describe uh, the polyglutamine fragment. And what this uh, shows is that you should get a T square dependence on the initial uh, progress of the aggregation reaction. And uh, that is what has been experimentally observed for a few proteins. Uh, See, and see, the, there is a big problem in doing experimental studies of aggregation uh, if you, and analyzing these experiments in the way you would want to. And the problem is this, that for getting all these uh, parameters, you need to know concentrate, to do concentration dependent studies. So, you need to study aggregation at different protein concentrations. And uh, the problem is to, in aggregation, is to get reproducible data. Uh, it is very difficult to get 
you know aggregation kinetic traces falling on top of each other without doing a very large body of preliminary work to establish conditions where this happens. And uh, so t unless you can do that, you cannot do protein concentration dependent studies because then you don't know whether the changes are because of the way you're doing your experiment or because you're changing the protein concentration. And if you can't do that, you can't do detailed analysis of the aggregation kinetics. So it's very important to be able to establish conditions where you can do studies in a reproducible manner. So you, when you see different types of aggregation, your, either your homogeneous nucleation, you see this, you would expect a T square for the first 20 percent or so of the reaction. If you are heterogeneous, you expect an exponential and here you would expect some power law if you had a downhill aggregation process. And there are many different papers which try to distinguish between this, but as I said, it's not always easy to study this. Um, it so happens that many, for many proteins, the aggregation kinetics become more reproducible when you do studies at lower pH. And uh, uh, you can then get more reproducible data, and whereas at, at pH values near 7, it becomes more and more difficult to get, get uh, reproducible data. Okay. So um, there are three criteria for nucleation-dependent polymerization. And, uh, you know, you expect a lag phase, the slow reaction being slow initially and then speeding up. You expect a critical concentration and you expect seeding. And if you want to say that you have nucleation-dependent polymerization, all three conditions have to be met. Because the other conditions can, if only two are met, it could very well be isodesmic or linear aggregation. And uh, we have been struggling in several systems to try and, di to try and distinguish between nucleated uh, NDP, the nucleation-dependent polymerization, and uh, isodesmic polymerization, and it's not at all easy to do so. Uh, the lag phase, if you just had, you know, if you just write a scheme where you have six steps or seven steps of uh, A plus A1 plus A1 giving you A2, A2 plus A1 giving you A3, it was up to A7, A8, and just do a simul uh, standard kinetic simulation, you will get a lag phase. So lag phase by itself, although many people will take as a nucleation-dependent polymerization, is not a signature for... Uh, for uh, nucleation dependent polymerization. And even, so you need all three criteria to be met for nucleation dependent polymerization. And by analyzing the lag phase, you can get the, uh, uh, the size of the nucleus. But again, here you need to be able to do a concentration dependent study. You change the protein concentration into studies, and I've already mentioned the problem with doing that. So, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Sequential uh, addition hmm. kind of calculation. I mean, you have both forward and backward rates, yeah. right? Okay, so then that's not very different from a nucleation barrier. Calculation. You're just assuming what the barrier is. Yeah, so it's, right? it's in principle, it's very similar, except you're not changing your rate constants. So it's... Uh, so if you look at studies on amyloid fibril formation, there are very... the number of proteins on which, you know, nucleation-dependent process has been identified is probably two or three. It's, it's uh, because you cannot, it's very difficult to do a full protein concentration dependence. And one case I mentioned, the polyglutamine fragment. But other than that, it's, uh, you know, it's very, you'll see one or two of these criteria being met, but you'll see usually seeding happening, you'll see the lag phase disappearing. But uh, you can't really... You know, maybe synuclein, there's been some study, but synuclein is notorious in getting, for getting reliable data. 
so it's it's not easy to show that you have a process where there is some critical nucleus being formed in the aggregation process. Uh, for proteins such as transthyretin, it's been suggested that uh, you have a downhill polymerization process, so things are just uh, adding on with in a linear way, and you don't have a barrier to be surmounted. But uh, it's really a question of uh, what you mean by downhill uh, polymerization. So you have secondary nucleation processes, which I uh, mentioned, and uh, you know all of them would lead to exponential growth of the total mass of fibril with time. Uh, but you know, depending on the rate constants of the steps, you could or could not, you may or may not see a lag phase. So there are just again one or two proteins in which secondary nucleation mechanisms have been studied, and it's uh, you know in a quantitative manner. And so the there is a lot of problems in getting good reliable data in aggregation uh, work. Uh, one instance where it has been done well is on sickle cell hemoglobin by Bill Eaton and company. So if you do an experimental study on protein aggregation, uh, you know, you very often may see an exponential change in whatever signal you are, are uh, measuring. Okay, so let's say you have some fluorescent signal which you can measure, and that's how very often aggregation is measured. You have a fluorescent dye which can bind to amyloid fibrils, and its fluorescence increases as fibrils grow in number. And you can plot that as a, you know, it looks exponential, so you put it on a log plot, you will see a straight line, which is described by this, and then you have uh, just by simple manipulation, you will have an expression for the rate of change is equal to some constant minus C minus Ft. So this is a simple equation to solve. Okay. So this represents the rate of fluorescence increase at time t. So this is the type of kinetics you will see when you add uh, a seed to a solution. And I'm just quickly describing how experimentalists will simplistically examine data in a somewhat empirical manner. Uh, so you can, uh, for example, describe uh, the polymerization reaction as P plus M giving you uh, P. Uh, and uh, so then you can uh, the rate of growth is equal to the forward minus the backward, where m is changing uh, with time from the initial value m0. So again, if you now combine this, you will get, a, uh, if you put this into this, you will get a form similar to that, and that's why you have that exponential equation which uh, you see for describing the polymerization process. And you can then, again using these equations, come to show that the critical concentration is nothing but the inverse of the dissociation, uh, is equal to the dissociation constant or the inverse of the association constant. So experimentally, you can empirically treat your data and, and get some idea of what's happening. But uh, you know, to get things like the size of the nucleus, becomes very difficult. To get an idea of what the structure of the nucleus is even more, more difficult because by definition it's the, it's the least populated species in your uh, sample. So what I'll do is I'll, since I'm all, it's already an hour, I'll skip some part and I'll talk a little about uh, our own work in the last uh, half an hour. Sure, if there are any questions, I'll... no?
uh, I already talked about that Basta oligomer which goes into forming uh, protofibrils. And uh, so this is now the work of a student Santosh in my lab. And this is work where aggregation happens at a low pH. And things are very reproducible. You get nice hyperbolic uh, growth curves. And you, it's very easy to measure concentration dependences of the kinetics, etc. And after his initial study, which I summarized in one slide a little early on in the talk, he, Santosh, decided to do a cysteine scanning mutagenesis. So the idea here is you have your sequence of the protein, you mutate one residue at a time at a different position, and you see how, what that substitution uh, at that position does to the kinetics of aggregation. So the idea is to try and find out which residue positions in the sequence might be important in the aggregation. So it's important to realize now that you know the structure of, in most aggregation reactions, you know the structure of the native protein. The structures of these early oligomers are very poorly understood. Uh, Dave has mentioned that in his first talk that it's only now that there's some structural information coming out on the oligomers. We had some gross information on the oligomer for BASTA from our NMR work, um, but we were quite lucky in doing that. For other proteins, it's really information is not really there. So the way people go about it is by doing such types of mutational work. You change a residue and see the effect. And what Santosh did was for about, I forget the number out here, of about 15 different residue positions, he put a cysteine. He, he purified each of those 15 proteins with a cysteine at a different location and studied the aggregation process for, uh, for each of those mutant proteins. And he found that for some positions, the mutation, the introduction of the cysteine at those positions grossly uh, had a big effect on the kinetics of the aggregation. So if this was the parent protein, you, this was well below the th plus minus three standard deviations uh, in the rates, spread of the rates. And what he did was then measure the kinetics for these two against any of the others. And at different, at the high concentrations, you see this big difference. At the low concentrations, he didn't really see a difference in the aggregation rates. And he went on to study what might be happening. And I won't, so what you do is you look at the aggregation uh, by using multiple probes, uh, you use size measurements, fluorescence measurements, secondary structure measurements, scattering intensity measurements. And what he could show is that in this case, the end product of the aggregation was mainly spherical oligomers and very few protofibrils, whereas in this case, it was mainly protofibrils. So I won't really describe that in any many more detail, but you could see, for example, that the structures of the end products were different. The sizes in the two cases were different, uh, et cetera. So in one case, so the two cases are, one case are these two slow guys, and the other case is one is this and one was one of the other guys, which were all roughly similar. So when the kinetics is suppressed? So we found that the end product structure was very different. So, um, so what happened was that for these two guys, the end product really consisted of mainly spherical oligomers. There's a much larger fraction of spherical oligomers. And the difference in the kinetics which we saw, I'm not really showing you all the data because it would take too long, was because the spheric in, for the two slow f aggregating proteins, the conformational change was taking place at the level of the spherical oligomers. See, when aggregates form, it's not only just growth, but the protein undergoes a conformational change. There's more beta sheet structure being formed. So the question was whether beta sheet structure forms in the early guys or after growth or along with growth. And what uh, Santosh was able to show by doing these single mutation experiments is that you could flip the conformational change from happening early to late 
and by doing so you could change whether the end product was, uh, so it looks like the, the protofibrils get stabilized only when the conformational change happens. If the conformational change happens early on, then the process does not really proceed to the, there is no need for it to proceed to the protofibrillar stage, it gets stabilized at the spherical oligomer stage. It, it goes to the protofibril but very slowly. The protofibrils, for example, are very different. These two, which are the slow guys, have um, one and a half times the diameter as measured by AFM heights on the mica than the other guy, any of the other guys. So the structures, internal structures, the external structures of these are different, and this difference is caused by single mutations in the. And so what we proposed at that time in this publication last year was that there were two pathways for aggregation, one in which conformational change happened in the spherical oligomers and one in which it happened in the long uh, protofibrillar structures. So what Santosh went on to do was to look at aggregation and the different so solve. Well, it's the not. Monomer, uh, the monomers are disordered in the first pathway. They're not fully disordered. They are. They have some alpha helical structure, and then they g start getting more beta sheet structure only after this, uh, along with uh, lengthening of the aggregate. Uh, how do you know they have alpha helical structure? Because we can take this A form, the starting point, and we that's a soluble oligomer which we characterize by NMR. So it's easy to show because it. If you just take it at room temperature, it takes three weeks to go into this pathway. So we do the study at, a, at 50 degrees because it just speeds it up. So if you take it at room temperature, you have all the time in the world to study the sky. But that's a monomer, right? It's not a monomer. It's a 16 mer. What protein is this? This is Basta. So it goes into a soluble oligomer, which is a 16 mer, mm -hmm. very rapidly. And, and you could so that the NMR of the 16 mer? Yeah, we had, so that's what I showed you that reverse micelle structure was of the 16 mer. So it's a monomer in terms of, uh, of being the building block for these protofibrils. But uh, this is formed from the actual monomer uh, very, very rapidly uh, in uh, tens of seconds. So you, you think that the A form, which has 16 bar stars stuck together, the, the, the monomers have basically native-like structure in that A form? We don't know whether how much of the structure is native-like. Uh, it's, see the, pr see the problem is this, the N termini have no structure, mm -hmm. okay, because we can show that by NMR. The C terminus is stuck in the core of the aggregate and the core of the aggregate is completely silent to solution NMR because the core is tumbling very slowly so it does not show any peak in the NMR spectrum. The N-terminal fragments are free to rotate and they show sharp lines so we can get information on them but what is happening in the core is something which we have no information. Uh, we have at one time done some fret experiments on that and the distances are lot bigger than in the native but we didn't really do a full characterization. So we, you know, I showed that rather crude picture of a reverse micelle with these arms, end terminal arms sticking out. We know nothing about the core of the aggregate. Yeah, it's different from the fib because different spectroscopic signatures change. So there's far more beta sheet structure in the in the fibrillar structures than in the, the spherical oligomer. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean the question is how does one do the comparison, so it is not because it is now aggregated to get any proper structural. I think now there are some, I mean there are now NMR methods which can look at large objects such as this, but uh, we have not gotten down to looking at uh, using those. Uh, it is probably possible now with NMR. So, what was, so what we Santosh also went on to do was to see how different solvent conditions affected uh, aggregation and you know the standard model for amyloid fibrils from David Eisenberg's uh, X-ray crystallographic work is that you have a bilayer motive that you have two beta sheets and the interdigitated digitating side chains uh, are what stabilize this type of interaction and so you have something like this uh, going down the axis of the uh, of the fibril in a cross beta type in that twisted ribbon type manner. Uh, but what we found when we looked at the fibrils, protofibrils formed in the presence of uh, an alcohol which lowers uh, hydrophobic interactions, uh, strengthens hydrogen bonding interactions is that the fibrils are much thinner and if you measured the diameters from the heights on AFM mica they were half the diameters of these guys and the internal structures measured by FTIR or by circular dichroism were also different. The stabilities were very different. Uh, the single chain, uh, so what we thought was, uh, we proposed was that these were actually uh, not bilayers of beta sheets but a single monolayer of a beta sheet which is going down the axis in this manner. And because it is a single uh, um, monolayer, it was much less stable and it would break up much, much faster than the bilayer. So this internal structures were also different in terms of secondary structure. So you can by manipulating conditions either by aggregation conditions or the sequence of the protein show that you have get different types of protofibrils in terms of the internal structure, in terms of the external morphology. Parallel arrangement, right? Or uh, okay, so what, yes, uh, so what I did not mention is that, well, we have studied this guy, uh, the one formed in the absence of any alcohol, by, by fluorescence anisotropy measurements. And what is, what we found quite fortuitously is that, you know, so what doing those measurements, you have to put a fluorescent label. Uh, on the chain and you do that by putting a cysteine first and then putting a fluorescence label. And so what we found was that, uh, so putting a fluorescence label is somewhat like making a mutation to the protein. So we found that at some positions if we put the fluorescence label, the two, the label and the unlabeled did not co-aggregate. Uh, at other positions, it did not matter if the fluorescence label was present. And by doing, looking at positions all along the sequence, this is again a paper we published late last year, we could, sh so the way we interpreted the data is that if you put the label at a position which formed the core of the aggregate, then that perturbed the, did, that did not allow co-aggregation of labeled and unlabeled. Whereas labeled and, la very surprisingly labeled and labeled could come together Unlabeled and unlabeled could come together, but labeled and unlabeled could not come together. Uh, so, uh, but at some positions it did not matter and labeled and unlabeled could come together. So those we said were outside and those were all at the N-terminal part. Remember in the A form, the N-terminal part is not part of the core of the aggregate. So even in the protofibrils, it seems it is not part of the core of the aggregate. Uh, that is the way we interpreted the data. This was published last year. And uh, again there we proposed that it is a parallel, I mean the only way we could interpret it was on the basis of a parallel beta sheet because only the N terminal segments were 
were not involved in the core of the aggregate in the protofibrils. So, the kinetics instead of being exponential started become became sigmoidal in the presence of the alcohol. Uh, again, uh, we interpreted all this data on the basics of an isodesmic a linear aggregation model and not a nucleation dependent model. So, I would not really talk more in detail about this, but what happens when you add the alcohol is that this A form becomes initially more helical and then it goes into these monolayer beta sheet protofibrils. Uh, and we still do not know whether these protofibrils directly go into mature fibrils. Uh, it is possible to get mature fibrils by, we have not seen mature fibrils form from protofibrils in the absence of alcohol or in the presence of TFE, but if we uh, change the aggregation conditions in other ways, we can see the standard 10 nanometer thick fibrils being formed. We do not know in this case whether these are going directly or this comes from here or this breaks down to monomer and then the monomer comes down here. So, these are all problems which are important to f address because if you want to know how these form, you need to know what the precursor species are. So, I will in the last 10, 15 minutes, I will talk a bit on the our work on the prion protein. Uh, so, this is again, uh, I think, briefly described by Dave. Uh, so, this is a protein uh, which has got, it is about 220 residues long and so the actual protein is this because this is a part which is cleaved off and we have been working on the full length mouse prion protein which is this part. So, this is the work of Shweta who is in the audience and much of the protein, all this part seems to be completely unstructured at least in the absence of copper ions or other heavy metal ions. And this is the part which has structure and the structure of this has been solved by NMR. This part is presumably completely disordered. Um, so, there are only models for what happens when this protein aggregates. The aggregated form associated with disease is called a scrapy form because prion diseases in sheep are called scrapy. And uh, the, you, you only have a model for what happens to the protein in the scrapy aggregated form. Okay. So, models for prion aggregation are very similar to amyloid fibril formation. So, you have a seed being formed which is your nucleus and then you have an elongation phase going to fibril. What happens in the, uh, in seeding what you do is you take the fibril and you add it to your starting species and, and you have further aggregation happening. In the prion uh, aggregation process, the scrapy form which is the aggregated form acts like a seed just like for any other protein. So, the process of this autocatalytic process for the prion is very similar to seeding of aggregation amyloid fibril formation which is seen for A beta or hunting things, polyglutamine proteins or any other of those aggregating proteins. So, Again, if you look at, you see these nice worm-like fibrils being formed by the prion protein. Uh, we could do this, Shweta could do this in a very reproducible manner. What we found is that again, just like for Basta, there was this 16 mer being formed. For the uh, mouse prion protein, again, there was a soluble oligomer being formed. Not just one, but two. There's a large one and a small one. And what she could do uh, by doing standard kinetic experiments to show that the large one is going into worm-like worm fibrils. The small guy does not go into worm-like fibrils at all. And the equilibria between small and large oligomers is very, very slow. So, on the time scale of the aggregation, at least which we study, we cannot see interconversion of the slow or the small and large oligomers. But we could show that the large ones are going directly to the oligomers. Um, I won't, this is just the data to show that. I won't describe it uh, in any detail. I just want to point out that again the kinetics are exponential and we don't see any lag phase in the kinetics. So, oligomer means a 16 mer again? 
No, these are considerably larger than uh, 16 ma. I think it, the size is 30, 40 ma or so. Is that right? Okay. So it, it's uh, it's larger than a uh, 16 ma. Uh, so what? So again, this protein will do it at room temperature, uh, but uh, it is takes too long at room temperature. Again, there's a large activation energy. So if you do it at 50 degrees, it becomes uh, you know, amenable on the lab time scale. You know, in a couple of hours, you will see aggregates. And one of the interesting results for which we still don't have uh, a proper explanation is that if you do aggregation at a higher concentration, you see only short, fibril, proto, uh, short fibrils. The lo s lower the concentration, the longer the lengths of the fibrils. And we have hand-waving explanations for this in terms of there being more nucleating centers uh, in this case than in this case, but it's not at all satisfactory. And one would want uh, it to be nice to have a more satisfactory explanation for why length depends on concentration in this. I don't know, it just sounds it too hand-waving to me. So... Okay, me. Okay. Okay, so so we've been again using multiple probes. We have a mechanism very similar to BASTA. If you look at these worm like fibrils of the prion protein and you know they look very similar to the protofibrils of BASTA. You can't really tell the difference. The mechanism also seems to be very similar. You start off with oligomers, you become you have larger critical oligomers and then you have steps which seem to indicate that lateral association is happening right at the end uh, so what uh, we you know to get structural information on these oligomers is very very difficult and but uh, you know you can try and make mutations and see uh, how that affects the stability and very fortuitously, uh, we, Shweta, had some mutations made which indicated the stability of these oligomers, these uh, which lead to fibril formation, uh, are quite uh, strongly affected by the mutation. So these are mutations which are associated with disease, except for one of them, which is was made mainly to introduce a fluorescent. Uh, signal into the protein, a probe into the protein. But you find that, you know, for the wild type protein, uh, as, uh, aggregation is happening at low concentrations. For these, for this one, for example, it's happening at a 10 times higher concentration and this somewhere in between. So you're changing the stability of these oligomers by these mutations. We still don't understand what is happening, but the kinetics of aggregation then get affected dramatically because you're changing the amount of the oligomer being present. So for the wild type, rates are high. For this mutation where there's very little of the, of the large aggregate uh, oligomer present, you can barely measure the rate. And again, the, by either mutation or changing salt, you can change the amount of large oligomer and the rate goes with the fractional amount of the large oligomer. So uh, we could, she's also done a study where she's done, used different salt concentrations to study aggregation. And there's a very fine tuning by salt. So for example, in the absence of sodium chloride, you just cannot, any salt, you just cannot measure any aggregation process. In the pre so you, but then over a very narrow range of salt concentration, you suddenly start seeing aggregation. And that's different, the ranges where you see aggregation are different for different salts. And she could show that this is happening because of salt binding to the uh, protein and not because of uh, electrostatic uh, screening or other effects such as that. And uh, so by doing 
uh, studies such as this, again she could identify two pathways for aggregation by using these multiple probes. And again, like BASTA, you could see uh, conformational conversion preceding elongation in one case and happening along with elongation in the other case. So this is something which is, I think, just appearing in biochemistry. So, uh, so these are these worm-like fibrils, the pro and these are all done at low pH. At high pH, uh, you can get long straight fibrils which are 8, 9 nanometers thick. And there the kinetics became sigmoidal. And Shweta, along with uh, uh, Gayatri in the lab, uh, sp have spent a lot of time trying to make these, these aggregation curves reproducible. And it's now possible for them to do protein de concentration dependent studies. And we are trying to get more detailed information on how this aggregation process is, uh, proceeds. Now this looks like a standard nucleation dependent polymerization process. You have a lag phase and then it goes in a sigmoid, I mean, so and you have the sigmoidal shape. This is, doesn't have that T-square dependence which you expect for homogeneous nucleation. This has got more what you expect for uh, secondary nucleation uh, kinetics. But uh, the question is, is this, what, do you, what type of species are present out here, and that's something which uh, they are currently studying. And uh, so, as I said, you can form both long straight fibrils and you can see worm-like fibrils, and Sheena Radford's group has shown roughly the same thing for another protein, uh, beta microglobulin, can also do the same, same thing. Uh, so you see the prion protein fibrils are very ribbon-like. You can see they're twisted ribbons in EM pictures. So if you take a uh, AFM picture of what's present out here, you see these spherical oligomers, whereas at the end you will see long straight fibrils. And we are trying to, right now at present, trying to understand the role of these spherical oligomers uh, in the formation of this. Are these leading directly to this or are they just off pathway to fibril formation. So this is something which we don't understand and they're currently trying to see what is, hap what is present at different points along the aggregation curve now that they can get the curve in a reproducible manner. So I'm not really going to talk about this, I, about tau, because uh, there's a poster outside and I'm sure Gayatri will will be happy to show it to you if you haven't already seen it. So tau is another protein which whose aggregation we are studying. We are studying the aggregation of a fragment of it which binds to, I don't, my computer doesn't like that slide, but uh, I'm not going to, I just want to introduce the study because uh, the poster is outside. Again, for this, you can get either hyperbolic aggregation curves or sigmoidal aggregation curves just by changing aggregation conditions. The type of fibrils seem to be, which forms seem to be present, uh, seem to be different by FTIR spectra and also in the AFM images. And uh, we are trying to understand the basis for what this is happening, the mechanism of formation of this. This is not very reproducible as yet, but these curves are very reproducible. You can do concentration dependent studies and get an idea of the mechanism which is described in Guy 3's poster. So with that, I'll, so this is some of our data. Again, you can see protofibrils uh, during the course of fibril formation. We don't know whether they directly lead to fibril. Protofibrils are much thinner. They're only 2, 3 nanometers in height, as the fibrils are about 10 nanometers in height. We don't know whether these lead directly to fibrils. We think they do not because they disappear much earlier than fibrils appear. So they, there are some off-pathway species which are formed very transiently and they disappear, seem to disappear well before fibrils start appearing. So one two, of the questions which we are still very interested in is, are these guys directly leading to protofibrils? For BASTA and for the prion protein, this seems to be the case. Uh, 
we don't know whether protofibrils directly lead to mature fibrils. This is something which is kind of assumed by people. If you look at any attempt to show this directly, the evidence is pretty weak. There are only two or three studies, uh, one with uh, A beta and the other with uh, synuclein. And the problem is that these usually form rapidly and these usually form over very long time scales. And so it's, if they form on completely different time scales, it becomes very difficult to do kinetic experiments which show that this go directly to this. Uh, we are hoping with, the, in the case of tau, it looks like this doesn't go directly to this, but this goes like this to here. Uh, but we still need to uh, be able to establish that. So the general idea in the field is that protofibrils somehow get together to form mature fibrils, but the evidence is not particularly strong uh, that this really happens, and it's something which we are very interested in studying. So with that, I'll come to the end of my talk, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So you showed that uh, the worm-like uh, fibrils that you were getting in one case was for lower, uh, sorry, at higher concentrations, and uh, long straight fibrils were at uh, No, they were at different pH values. Uh, no, I think there was one slide before that. I think it was in the case of bar star, I think. Yeah, the length, the length of the... The fibrils. length? Uh, there was a, uh, there, it was at two different concentrations, I think. Ah, the, you had fibrils of different length. Uh, yes. Yeah. So at, at high concentrations, you had shorter ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so could it be that uh, actually what happens is that they grow to a longer length and then break away? Uh, after they reach a particular length into shorter? It's because they are unstable at some... It's possible except that we don't... I mean, why should they... I mean, if the long ones are pretty stable at the low concentration, they're not breaking. So why should the guys formed at the higher concentration be more break? Uh, no, but I mean, there'll be some typical length scale, right, up to which, I mean, it, it might be that they, they are, it, they're stable enough up to a certain length. But then, uh, because of the concentration is very high, they actually grow very fast to a much very longer long. length and then uh, be but become then unstable they, and break off. They shouldn't break up to things which are much smaller than that. I mean, yeah, so I don't know the length scales, actually, whether... So uh, we don't have any evidence for them growing longer. So we can keep track of their length in solution by dynamic light scattering measurements. And okay. the length only, you know, approaches a limiting value. It doesn't go up and then come back down. Okay. So there's no transient uh, longer guy being formed. Oh. Oh. Thanks. Uh, I have something to ask regarding, again, the length of, uh, I mean, peptides, the tubes. Uh, I have designed some uh, peptide tubes, which, uh, I mean, I have aggregated them slowly up to 14 monomer units and more, but I find that after 14 monomer units, they, uh, the interaction in energy reduces, but it uh, goes, uh, I mean, it, the interaction energy is quite uh, uh, good, up to 18, 20, and so on. Uh, a smaller dimension, um, if I take a, take a smaller uh, monomer unit, then I find aggregation till ninth monomer unit, and then the tenth it falls back. I mean, the interaction energy is not uh, as high as in ninth. Then again, from tenth to uh, sixteen or seventeen, it increases and again falls back. I cannot, I don't know the reason for that. Can you explain something? But it's a totally fifty system. I think this length or the dimensions really are dependent on the surface areas which change upon association because the energy of the association depends upon that surface area. And, uh, you know, that's why th uh, I'd mentioned briefly, I think, that, you know, 3D clumps form precipitates, whereas 1D normally will remain and very often will remain in solution. And so I think if you have smaller objects which are forming linear tubes, 
the it, it's a function of these surface areas which which interact in the in the association and uh, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it but uh, it must be something to do with that I, maybe dave would probably have a better idea thank you so you're doing this in the lab or on the computer computer what on the computer yeah and then you can answer let's thank uh, jayant again uh, thank you